Welcome everybody to GG497 Geological Visualization. Given the interesting times that we're currently living in, I thought I'd try my best to turn this module, which teaches you how to interpret geological maps, how different geological features present themselves on geological maps, and how to build geological cross sections from maps into a fully online lecture series. Accompanying these lectures will be practicals which I will demonstrate as well as a list of online resources which should allow you to take part fully in everything that I'm demonstrating. Many of the examples that we'll use to present ideas are taken from these two um, textbooks which are available in, in our library and probably many other university libraries out there. So once things are back to normal, I'd recommend that you guys have a look at these. What I've tried to do with this lecture course is to add complexity every week um, and start by introducing what maps look like what you can expect to find on maps and then to add in geology increasing complexity as we go so as soon as we start understanding maps we'll then move on to geological maps and how horizontally bedded and vertical strata appear on maps then we'll look at what rocks look like when those strata are inclined when they're no longer horizontal or vertical when they when they have some angle of dip then we'll increase complexity again and look at folded rocks then we'll look at other planar features like unconformities and faults then we'll look at how we can use the information on a geological map to understand the geological history of an area and then finally hopefully with all of that material that we've understood we'll be able to prepare for our exam. Each one of the labs that I'll demonstrate along with each of the lectures is available for you to try in your course booklet. This is also available on Student Central and the Teams area and each one of these exercises will relate to real geological maps and conceptual geological maps and also available on student central is a completed or model answer i guess if you want to think, think of it that way for you to check your progress as we go through the lecture series Okay, so our first session then will help us find our way around a geological map. And the thing to remember that maps are just a way of presenting the distribution of data within two dimensional space. The types of maps that we're probably most used to are topographic maps, which tell us something about the ground level, the topography, uh, the human settlement, the infrastructure. But there's nothing stopping you plotting any other kind of two-dimensional data and making a map. For example, in ore processing, one of the key things you need to know is exactly in which minerals the elements that you're interested in reside. So you can plot the spatial distribution of different elements and make an element map for a rock or a thin section. You can plot geophysical data like the um, gravity or the electro resistivity of an area and plot that in two dimensional space and make a geophysical data map. But what we're going to focus on in this module is representing geological data in two dimensional space, making geological maps and interpret interpreting them. Okay, so all geological maps, before we start plotting the geology on them, will have this sort of standard topographical base which gives us all of our infrastructure 
information, all of our coordinates, all of our ground height information that then we can overlay the geology onto. The first thing to note is that most maps will have a grid system which separates out the map into a geographical coordinate system. On your standard um, topographic map, the grid lines which run north-south, so up and down the map, they're referred to as the Eastings and they give uh, the map its X coordinate, so the distance along the map in the east and west direction. While the grid lines which run parallel to east-west, like horizontal if you want to think of it that way, they're the northern grid lines and they give a coordinate its Y value. Now most of the time you'll have one of these grids on your map but sometimes in some maps they don't necessarily have a grid because I guess some people think it, it can clutter a map. So in that case if you don't have those grid lines then you can find out which way is north because north on most real maps is always oriented parallel to the text. Okay, So the, the way that you would read text on a map that's oriented so north is the right way up. Okay, so for in our example, you can see the names and the numbers um, for our uh, geographical points of interest. The right way up points in the direction of north. The second thing that maps will have on them is a scale or a scale bar. In this case, we have a scale bar which shows us the length of a line on the map and what it equates to a real distance on the ground. So for example the length of this black line in the bottom right hand corner of your screen tells you the length of one kilometer in, in real life on the ground. So each point on this map can be identified using its easting or X coordinates and northing or Y coordinates which give it a location. And locations by convention are reported using the easting value first and then the northing value second. So for example if we were to find ourselves at point A on this map, our easting coordinate you can see that it lands right on the 300 grid line. So our easting coordinate would be 300. And we can see that point A lands directly on the northern grid line for 460. So our grid reference, our coordinate grid reference would could either be reported as 300 460 as just a six figure grid reference or 300 comma 460 depending on which convention you're using. But the key point is, is that regardless of convention, the easting coordinate is the one that's reported first. That's a pretty easy example because you know we've landed right on the intersection of two grid lines we don't have to work anything out. But that what then would be your coordinates if you were stood at point B for example. Now in order to work this out you need to check what the scale for the map is because that scale will allow you to break down each one of these grid squares into smaller and smaller intervals which will give you a more precise grid reference location. So if we were to do that with the grid square that we're inhabiting at point B, let's see if we can magnify this up and split it into smaller and finer more precise intervals. Okay so this is our grid square blown up so we can see it in more detail. And you can see that our bounding lines for our grid square in terms of eastings are the 300 and 310 line and in terms of northings are the 460 and 470 grid line. Now thankfully most modern maps are drawn using a metric scale which allows you to separate or further differentiate these large grid squares into intervals of tenths. Okay, so what we can do is turn our grid square into an even finer grid by drawing 10 different 
intervals, equally spaced intervals, which will allow us to work out the fractions of grid square that we are in. When you do that, hopefully you can see that our easting grid reference becomes counting from the 300 towards the right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So our easting coordinate becomes 309. And our northern coordinate, if we count upwards from our 460 northern line, becomes 461, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So our northern coordinates becomes 468. Once you become adept at this, having to split up a map into a finer and finer grid spacing becomes no longer necessary and you can measure it directly. But just for another example, this house that's displayed on the map, it would have the grid coordinates of 491 by 45123, while the mountain top would have grid coordinates of 301 and 451234567789 now the thing to remember is that a map is simply a scaled representation so the real world I guess however many kilometers wide it might be in your particular map area has been shrunk down so it fits on the space of a page. Now because that's a scale drawing it has to have a scale so that you can um, calculate back what real life differences are. And one of the things to remember is that the both the x-axis and the y-axis have the same scale. Now in order to work out distances across maps in a precise way, we need to understand what the scale factor of that map is. Now the way that we do that is to measure directly on the map the length of our scale bar in, meter, in uh, millimeters or centimeters and then recognize what real geographical distance that scale bar represents. So for example here we have a generalized geological map of the British Isles and we have a scale bar which represents 200 kilometers of real life distance and you'll have to take my word for it but if you were to measure this scale bar on my screen it would have a length of 40 millimeters. Okay, so what we can then do is calculate the absolute scale of the map. So what we've got so far says that 40 millimeters on the map is equal to 200 kilometers in real life. So before we can start working out what distance is on the map uh, or how to use this scale to work out distances on the map, we have to know what one millimeter, what a single unit um, of distance equals on our map to, to what it equals in real life. So if 40 millimeters equals 200 kilometers, then what we can do to work out the length of a single millimeter is to divide both sides of that scale by 40. So 40 millimeters divided by 40 and 200 kilometers divided by 40 gives us, cancels down to one millimeter equals five kilometers. So our absolute map scale says that one millimeter measured on the map is equal to five kilometers on the ground in real life. So let's try and put this into practice then. Let's say that we wanted to find the distance from the mountain summit to the house. First thing that we do is measure the length of our scale bar as it is printed on the page and that tells us that the scale bar is 80 millimeters long, it's eight centimeters, is equal to one kilometer. So working out the absolute scale then we divide 80 by 80 and one kilometer by 80 and that tells us that one millimeter on the map is equal to 12.5 meters on the ground. 
So to answer our question, how far is the house from the mountain top? We measure the distance on the map between the two points. And in my example, that comes out to 92 millimeters. And then to convert that map distance into a real life distance, we multiply that, that 92 millimeters measured on the map by that scale factor that says that one millimeter is equal to 12.5 meters. And by doing that multiplication, we get the true real life distance between the two points. So that's how we can use maps to give us a distance. The other thing that maps can do is tell us the bearing or direction between two different points. And like I said, the um, writing on a map is oriented to north, um, as well as the eastern grid lines, they point in the direction of geographic north. And once we've recognized what direction north is on our map, then we can start um, devising compass bearings for different points on that map. Okay, so for example, let's say that we wanted to find the bearing of the mountain top from the house. After we figured out which way geographic north is, we could draw uh, or, or mark on our map a direction for geographic north and then at the same time draw a direction or a line from the point that we're at to the point we want to get the bearing from. Okay. At this point we need to use a compass or a protractor would, would do the job and measure the angle between geographic north, that line that we've just drawn that points towards north and the line which points to the um, object that we want to get a bearing to. If we were to measure that angle in this example, we'd find that the angle between geographic north and the mountain top is 63 degrees. Now conventionally, because um, there are 360 degrees in a circle, we give bearings as three figure numbers. So instead of just being 63 degrees, we would say that the bearing from the house to the mountain top is 063. This is particularly important for geology because, um, as we'll see in later lectures, uh, dips for inclined strata, they are referred to it using two digits and directions or compass bearings are you uh, refer to using three digits and this means that you can't ever get the two confused. If we use the mismatch of two digits and three digits for compass bearings you can see that sometimes you might get confused between what is an angle of dip of a bed and what is a compass bearing. So always 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 refer to compass bearings using three digits. What then if we wanted to go back the other way and find the bearing from the mountain top to the house. Well, we repeat the same process and draw one line to show the direction of geographic north and another line towards the object of interest, so in our case, the house. Then what we would do is measure clockwise the angle from geographic north to the line um, denoting our object of interest. It's very key that we remember that we measure that angle clockwise rather than just a simple angle between them. Okay, so because compass bearings are always measured clockwise from north, this means that you can never get confused and walk off in, in the wrong direction. So our in our example, the compass bearing from the mountain top to the house would be two four three degrees we wouldn't take this angle on the other side um, of the circle because that's that's anti-clockwise from north we'd only ever measure the orientation or compass bearing clockwise from geographic north compass bearings can also help if ever you become lost 
so let's say for example you're not you're not fantastic at reading maps and you're out in the countryside and you don't precisely know where you are on a map but you can see landmarks around you well what you can do is use your compass in the field aim at a landmark and read its bearing to do this you'd aim at a landmark and then rotate your your compass wheel so that the north arrow printed on the compass wheel lines up with the um, magnetic arrow on your compass once you have lined up your north arrow with your magnetic north arrow the point at which the compass wheel intersects the ticks at either end of the compass indicate the direction to the landmark that you're citing to and the um, bearing from the landmark back to yourself okay so what you would do is wherever you are on the map you would um, aim your compass at a landmark that you can recognize and then you would read off the tick that's closest to yourself so for example let's say that you find when you've done this that you exist on a bearing of 065 from the tip of the lake in order for that bearing to be true you know that you must exist somewhere along that line that's now printed on the map exactly where along that line you must exist you can only answer by taking another point another bearing so let's say that you were lost on the countryside and you can recognize the end of the lake and now you wanted to recognize the, or, or now you're able to recognize the house you could repeat the process and take a bearing off that house and for our example let's say that it gives us a bearing of 0 1 5 degrees where those two lines intersect that's where you must be on the map now it's quite easy um, to <laughs> introduce inaccuracies using this method so we tend to constrain ourselves with a minimum of three points using this method so using our third point we could uh, feel confident of recognizing the summit of the hill when we do that we measure our bearing from the hill as being 305 degrees and hopefully you can see as you take more and more points and use more and more landmarks to define where you are the more precise the more accurate you'll end up being now we call this process triangulation the triangulation bit comes from the fact that we use a minimum of three points to give us our our location just as a bit of a side um, this is the gold plaque that was printed on the pioneer probe which was launched in um, 1971 and I think it has since or is about to leave our solar system beyond the um, gravitational attraction of the Sun but printed on that gold plaque is a whole uh, load of information aimed at um, extraterrestrial life to find out where we're from. This bottom part um, is, is trying to show the position of Earth and the direction that the probe took. This part of the um, plaque is showing you the size of the probe and the size of us so extraterrestrial life would, would understand just how large we are. But the point that I, I, the reason that this is in this lecture is because this diagram here shows extraterrestrial life, the relative distance of Earth from a series of pulsars. Now, pulsars are a particular type of star that releases um, bursts of radiation in a in a in a regular um, fashion, and that regularity is denoted by the dashes on each one of these lines, and the relative length of these lines explains the relative distance from Earth to these pulsars. So the theory is is that aliens recognize what these are and um, be able to triangulate our position in the cosmos. But that's just an aside. Now one thing to remember when you're in the field is what we call declination. And this comes from the fact that the geographic North Pole is defined as the rotation axis of the earth and it is not the same as the position of magnetic north okay the two things are different your map will be aligned to the geographic north pole 
but your compass will be obviously aligned to the magnetic North Pole and the two places aren't in the same place. Further to that, the magnetic North Pole moves over time due to the um, circulation in the liquid core. Earth's magnetic field can change orientation, change position. And what this map tries to show is the position of the North Magnetic Pole over the last um, 400 years or so. So because your map is aligned to geographic north and your compass is aligned to magnetic north, you have to introduce a correction factor so that the two things are lining up so that you can fool your compass, I guess, into pointing towards geographic north. And we call that correction factor, we call that declination. And it's the angle between the magnetic north pole and the geographic north pole, which will vary um, depending where you are on the surface of the Earth. So luckily for us in Brighton, the current position of the North Magnetic Pole and the uh, Geographic North Pole, from where we are in Brighton, they're pretty much in exactly the same direction. The, the, the difference is um, 13 um, minutes worth. Okay, so very, very small uh, for where we are in Brighton and there's no real need to modify your compass for our purposes because that fraction of a degree, um, it's, it's well within our, our precision as humans anyway, especially when we're doing cold field work somewhere. But let's say that you were doing field work in Northern Canada on Ellesmere Island, then this angular difference between the geographic North Pole and the magnetic North Pole becomes very, very important. So for example, at Eureka, your map would be um, oriented towards the geographic North Pole, but your compass without this correction factor would be pointing 51 degrees out um, towards the West. So when you're in these different places around the world, you need to modify your compass to take into this account, to take this into account rather. So this is a map that shows um, the magnetic declination for, for North America for 2010. And obviously these things have to be updated because the, the, um, ge uh, the magnetic North Pole moves around. But what it tries to show you is the angular difference in terms of West and East from your position in North America um, between the magnetic North Pole and the geographic North Pole. So always, always check when you do your field work that uh, that you've made the modification to your compass and when we go on field work we'll we'll show you how to do this now the point is the reason that i tell you that is without a correction for declination your compass bearings will be incorrect so if you have to tell somebody the direction to something and you haven't taken into account the declination of the area that you're in the uh, compass bearing that you give them will be incorrect okay so that's the general anatomy of a map and generally on our geological maps, the, the two-dimensional data that we present on that base layer before we start putting geology onto it are the ground heights, the topography of the area. And we call this sort of map that shows this information about ground heights, we call these contour maps. And they show you how a, some sort of variable changes in a geographical area. Okay, usually for us, this variable is ground height in other words topography but you can also show other things on one of these contour maps you know any variable that um that that can change in that geographical area you can plot that change using one of these contour maps and this example uh shows the 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 gravity anomaly of an area in north america 
uh, which is related to the density of the rocks and it tries to show you how that gravity anomaly changes in geographical area throughout the geographical area using a contour plot so this is showing the gravity anomaly but you can also use um, other um, variables or factors about the rock this shows the magnetic uh, the strength of the magnetic field in the area which might be related to the presence of metallic ore deposits but in each of these examples hopefully what you've seen is that these contours represent themselves as curvy linear parallel lines that join areas of equal value so for our examples as, as geologists these contours are usually um, joining areas of equal height and that height is measured relative to some sort of datum and for us as earth scientists that datum um, is usually sea level okay so going back to our map then you can now recognize these contours and you can see the um, ground heights which signify or which let us know what um, specific ground heights these important contours relate to and on a topographic map the spacing of the contours indicates something about the gradient of the ground so for example where the contour lines are close together that's telling you that you have a big change in vertical height in a, in a not uh, very big change in horizontal distance or in other words it's steep but where your contours are far apart you're having a small vertical change over a, a relatively long horizontal distance in other words it's a gentle slope so if ever you're planning your um, mapping projects or, or other sorts of field work like you will do when you when you carry out your dissertations you can use the contour spacing to understand ways that you might um, get around your area so this picture is um, from Snowdonia uh, from Llyn Idwal and the red star at the cliff there if we were to look at it in map view is in this region where your contour spacing is very 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 tight but the footpath that the walker is currently on denoted by the yellow star if we were to look on the map you can see that the um, contours are very well very far apart um, it's a very gentle slope okay so looking at our example here we have a region where the contours are very very close together indicating steep ground and here we have a region where the contours are um, dispersed they're far apart from each other we have a gentle incline okay these contours can also tell you um, what the direction of the slope is and if you think about it these lines are connecting points of equal height okay so this everywhere along this particular line is showing you where the ground height is 300 meters above sea level and everywhere along this line is showing you where the ground height is 250 meters above sea level so what we can do is use the orientation of these contour lines to figure out what the direction of the slope is and that's easily done by taking a line that's perpendicular to the slope going from the high values towards the low so from 300 down towards 200 taking that line perfectly perpendicular from the contours that will give us the slope direction so in the direction in which the hillside is sloping downwards we can also use the map and the contour heights to work out what the angle of slope is or how steep the slope is by working out between two points along that hillside what the change in vertical height is or h over the horizontal distance on the map or d those will give us the ratio between those will give us the tangent for the angle of slope and then we use simple trigonometry to turn that tangent of the angle into the angle itself 
one of the key skills that you'll learn in this module is how to build geological cross sections. In order to do that, one of the first things that we need to do is to be able to draw a hill profile. And what you can think of as a hill profile is if we were to take a slice through the crust along this line and then look at it side on. Like imagine if we took a slice and we made a cliff from that slice, what would the what would the vista, what would the landscape, uh, what would the profile look like for for that slice? Okay, so that brings us on to our first little bit of our practical, which is how to draw a, a hill profile, which is our first step for drawing geological cross sections. Okay, let's take this rudimentary map as uh, as an example of how we, how we go through the process. No matter how complicated your hill profile is, you'll follow these these steps. It might just take you a, a little bit longer to get all of the detail in. So let's start by wanting to draw a hill profile between X and Y, taking a slice between those two points on our map. The first thing that we do is use a strip of paper and mark on that strip of paper between the X and Y points all of the points that we cross the main topographic contour. So everywhere that we cross one of our topographic lines where it intersects our strip of paper, we mark on that strip of paper the ground height at that intersection. So here, for example, we've crossed the 400 meter contour, so I mark it and draw 400 under it and then do the same for 300 and so on. And then also mark on the points at which I've, I've hit a maximum, like the, the, the highest bit of a hill or the lowest part of a valley, just so I can then draw these as a hill profile. Then what we would do is take that strip of paper off of our map and move it to our cross section panel, the, 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 the piece of paper which will show us the, the side on view of our, of our hill profile. Then simply, we draw vertically downwards onto our cross-section panel and mark on the appropriate heights, those contour intersections that we just marked on previously. So for example, here on our cross-section strip, we crossed the 300 meter ground contour. So we draw vertically downwards onto our cross-section panel to the appropriate height so 300 hits at 300 400 hits at 400 I'm interpreting that's where the brow of the hill is so I draw it there and so on for the other points along our cross-section line then it's a simple case of joining the lines across our um, hill profile to give us an interpreted hill profile or topography along that section between X and Y. Okay, that's our real first step in drawing geological cross sections. We first of all have to get the topography accurate so that then we can show how the geology intersects and interacts with it. Now, as we build more complexity in this module, you'll move from just building simple hill profiles to actually including the geology. And if this process sounds familiar to you, then it's what we did if you were at the University of Brighton and went to the Pembrokeshire field trip, where we did a hill profile and plotted some of the geology, in, albeit in a, in a fairly basic way, for the laid intrusion that we found at St. David's Head. So now what you can do is turn to your lab book and start working on practical one. This lab book is designed to increase in difficulty every week. So we'll add complexity as we go along. And I really would stress that um, being involved with these labs, um, particularly in these trying times, will sincerely help when we come to run our exam, whenever that might be. 
Okay, so thanks for listening, and um, if you want to flip on over to the video where I go through our first lab, I'll see you there. Thanks.